Good morning. Happy Halloween, Lucky Follow Christian Church. And there's the it's a little bit crisp this morning, and uh, we're feeling fall in the air. It's a wonderful day. Uh, you still have time to get up and come to church today, so if you're listening, please do that. Uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, ten virgins, and this is going to be the parable of the bridesmaids. Before I start, I just want to be sure and remind you uh, that we are praying for Ramona, we're praying for Lisa, we're praying for Wayne, and now we're praying for Wayne's nephew who's in the hospital, has had surgery on his foot. Um, there are so many other people who need prayers right now. You know, prayer changes things. So please remember uh, everyone in prayer that just uh, needs our prayers at this time. Okay, you know, guys, this is the parable of the wedding, and it's a story of ten virgins, and uh, five of them were wives, and five of them were foolish. Before I talk about that story, I want to tell you about an experience that I had several years ago when I was going to a business meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and on the way, I stopped at Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and spent the night in a hotel there. And, you know, I, I started noticing, even when I was unloading my car, that there were Amish, horse-drawn Amish buggies going by that were full of people, and they were all dressed. Now, it was not a Sunday. It was not a Saturday. But there were people that were very dressed up, and they appeared to be going somewhere. And, you know, I noticed that, and then I noticed out my hotel window that I could see the street out in front of the hotel, and I could see these buggies that kept going by. And I was noticing, of course, you know, the difference. You can even tell when it's late at night because the buggies go very slow. <laughs> it's definitely not a car, and they had different kind of lighting on them. And so I asked one of the locals there, uh, what, why? Is this normal? Is this how it looks all the time? And she told me that November was Amish wedding month. And I said, you mean everybody gets married in November? And she said, well, except for those who have to have a necessary wedding, and they can happen at any time. But for the other weddings, it's always going to be in November. Now, you know, you think about that just a minute and you ask questions like, uh, why November? Well, it's because the crops are all in and the everything's basically done that the spring and the summer and the fall months that the farmers could do out in the fields. And now it's time that they can spend building things and making things and preparing for a new life together. So that's exactly the way it worked. And, and after they're married, they don't go on a honeymoon. They don't consummate the wedding. They go back to their parents' homes and they spend the winter months with in their father's house, not as a wedding couple, and the groom builds a room onto his father's house for the bride to come to in the spring. And the bride spends that time in preparation for making things for her home and preparing to move in in the springtime. And you know, when you hear that, you think, wow, that's nuts. You mean they get married and then they don't even see each other for several months? Where do they get that idea? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really odd to us. Okay, and then as you study and you start watching and listening to Jewish customs, you find out that the Amish are a lot more on track with the old Jewish customs than we are, certainly. But, you know, the, if you look at the customs of the Jews, their wedding was usually arranged and that would have been the two fathers, the father of the bride, the father of the groom. They would have ranged as early as, you know, 12 years old, that this is going to be, uh, your son is going to marry my daughter. Sometimes the, uh, the bride and groom didn't even know each other. Sometimes the bride and groom had not um, 
it, they hadn't even spoken and before the wedding took place. So first there was an arrangement and then there was the ceremony. Well, it, when the ceremony happened, this was this could be it could come at any hour of the day. The bride didn't know, and uh, as the groom was coming, a friend of the groom went before him and shouted, "Behold, the bridegroom comes!" And the shout was accompanied by the blowing of a trumpet. Does this sound familiar to you? And it was made out of a ram's horn. And as the shout was heard, the bridegroom would get his bride and take her back to his father's house where the ceremony and the celebration would take place. Now, this meant they were betrothed to each other. Now, what happened next? They did not go on a honeymoon. They did not consummate the wedding. She goes back to her father's house. He goes back to his father's house. And they stay apart and do not have the actual marriage ceremony for at least nine months, and that's to be sure that she's not pregnant, and that she's still chaste, and that she is uh, pure, and that she is a virgin. So isn't that interesting how that worked? And so that's exactly what this, uh, this feast is talking about here, this wedding ceremony, this uh, parable of the bridesmaids. It's the point where the groom is coming back to get the bride because all preparations have been made. The room has been built onto his father's house and he's ready now to go collect his bride. But here's the deal. Nobody knows except the groom's father when the wedding is going to take place. Now, do you see how Jesus was using a parable that the Jews could relate to in every kind of way when he's telling the story of the ten virgins. I just think it's remarkable how he interweaves these things and they're absolutely according to things that the Jewish the people would have understood perfectly. But in fact, you know, one of the saddest things in the world is that they can figure out he was the Messiah and they spent thousands of years looking for him but they never figure out it's him. And to this day, Orthodox Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's talk about these verses. I'm going to read Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil, olive oil, for their lamps. But the other five who were wise enough took along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. Now I want you to remember that one because I'm going to make a reference to it. Then verse 6, at midnight they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming, come out and meet him. Okay, so he didn't show up, and that's the thing, you know, if you would ask this Jewish man, when is the wedding, he would say, I don't have any idea, it's when the only one that knows that is my father. And so the father would make the arrangements for the wedding, and then he would tell his son, okay, you can go get your bride now, but until that time he could not. So here he comes, it's midnight, and everyone, they're shouting, okay, look, the bridegroom is coming, come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps, and I think King James says they trimmed their lamps, that's, you know, prepared their lamps, they added more oil to it, they got them ready. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are running out. The others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. 
but he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. According to Barclay, who is a Bible scholar, he was a little Scottish um, pre, uh, not priest, he was a minister, he was a Scottish minister. Uh, the parable of the virgins has at least two universal meanings, meanings, and I think we should really key on this. The first one is it warns us that there are certain things which cannot be obtained at the last minute. So, in other words, you know, when we get the opportunity of a lifetime and someone comes to us and says, hey, I've got this job for you, and you'll just love it, and it'll provide for your family, but if you don't have the skills, if you've not acquired the education or the skills to do the job, it's too late. You, they want you now. You see what I'm saying? It's easy to leave things undone for so long that we can no longer prepare ourselves to meet with God. Now, you know, I'd love to say as long as we're breathing, we can still accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But guys, you know, sometimes, and you see this, I see this, there are those that say, okay, well, I'm going to start believing and coming to church. And, you know, I, yeah, I believe in God, but I mean, I'm going to start coming to church. I'm going to start being faithful when I get old. I mean, I kind of want to live my life now. I want to do it my way. And I just really don't want to settle in and do it uh, any other way right now. Because, you know, I've still got a lot of years left. You know, we're not promised that we have tomorrow. And so sometimes we put it off too long. And then... At the moment that the Lord comes for us, either as we die in this life or when he comes back and we see him in the sky, at that point, there's no time to prepare. The second thing that Barclay points out is the parable warns us that there are certain things which cannot be borrowed. <laughs> you know, there's an old spiritual song that says, you got to walk that lonesome valley. you got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you, for you have to walk it by yourself. That is so true. No one can get you into heaven after you die. If you have not lived your life according to the will of God, no one can pray you into heaven. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> it's at that point. It's too late. The foolish virgins found it impossible to borrow oil when they discovered they needed it. But did they think they were ready? This is the scary part. This is for the people who say, well, I believe, I just don't, I just don't want to be involved right now in a church. So I'm okay because I believe. And when I was uh, 10 years old, I went down front and, and I said that I would let Jesus in my heart. No, well, I don't live like that. I mean, you know, and every once in a while I go to church. I go to church at Easter. But then when I come back home, do you leave Jesus at the door? <laughs> and when you walk back in, life goes on as usual, just like you want it to. That's not living for the Lord. And that's when we have to search our souls. I'm not trying to preach condemnation here. What I'm trying to preach is it's important that we know God and God knows us and that we're living our lives for him. We cannot borrow a relationship with God. We must possess it for ourselves. We cannot borrow a character. We must be clothed in our character. We cannot be living on a spiritual capital which someone else has amassed. Like if you had a really good mother, said, well, I had a really good mother, so that ought to be good for something. No, I'm sorry. It's up to the individual. There are certain things we must win or acquire for ourselves, for we cannot borrow our salvation from anyone else. You know, there's lyrics of an old song, another old song. 
He stands, he knocks, he calls, he waits. You know, Jesus is patient. He tarries at thy heart. So he stays there at your heart. He's asking, take me, I'm your savior. All you have to do is just follow the will of my father who is in heaven. Canst thou reject his gracious call? And wilt thou say depart? Oh, think on what a slender thread this moment hangs thy fate. Arise, admit thy heavenly guest, or else it will be too late. I'm going to end today with a scripture, Romans 13, 11 through 14. If you like your Bible lesson today, I really would appreciate it if you would push like because uh, it helps the church. Romans 13, 11 through 14, if you want to look it up, it says, Do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Do you see the correlation that I'm making? The virgins who were sleeping were those who thought they were ready, but they had not made the full commitment to bring enough oil to be prepared. So in other words, these, t these five virgins were the ones who were unfaithful. The other five were the faithful virgins who brought enough oil. That's the symbolism in the uh, parable. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Verse 12, the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 13, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in, se in sexual promiscuity, not in strife or in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Okay, I'm going to end on that today, and next week we're going to talk about the parable of the three servants that were given a gift before their master left town. I pray that you have an awesome Halloween, and you know, I've been sneaking some candy. It's really that time of year. Please pray for Ramona and Lisa and Wayne and Wayne's nephew, and just remember all those who need our prayers. And guys, I love you, and I'll see you at church, I hope.